Thank you and welcome to another episode of Living Legal Legends. Today's episode of our three digit project is, is called um, Maintaining a Sense of Humor, Maintaining Perspective in the Hectic World of Practicing Law in a Big City in America. That city is Honolulu. And I'm very fortunate today to have three distinguished three digit lawyers with me Art Reinwald, uh, 390 is your number. Correct? That is my number. And Jim Riston, who's 502. Correct? Jim? Correct. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. It's gloomy outside, but it's going to be sunny and cheery inside. So we're very happy to be here Count on it. in the basement of the Pioneer Plaza Think Tech Hawaii. Mr. Reinwald, let me start with you. Tell us about your background, how it is that uh, you ended up at the firm you ended up at, and what was the evolution of that in your life? Well, do we want to spend the whole hour on that? Uh, <laughs> give us a short uh, version, please. From the age of four, I knew I was going to be a lawyer, like my Uncle Lester. Four. From the age of four. And uh, when we went to, uh, through the various layers of school, I went to Drake University. And at the end of the second year, we were allowed to go into law school. So I did. I was in a hurry. And what year was that, if I might ask? Let's see, that would be about 1948. 1948. And uh, I decided somewhere in law school that I wanted to teach law school, so during the summers I went back and continued my liberal arts program and got my two degrees nine months apart. Wow. A bachelor's and a, a JD? Yeah. Okay. And did you go to, to work as a teacher? It, uh, that was a, sort of a roundabout thing. It, uh, I went around and pounded the doors of uh, the various law firms in Des Moines, Iowa, and ran into the startling uh, revelation that the firms really weren't interested in a boy lawyer. I was 22. 22. And uh, one day I'm walking across the campus about two months after graduation, I would see the dean and in his jovial way. He says, well, what are you doing, Reinwald? He says, I'm still looking for work. And he said, good. I just lost two professors to the Korean War, and I know you want to teach. So that Friday, I went into his office and signed a contract to teach uh, three courses in the com coming uh, semester. That afternoon, I got a call from Joseph Brody, the senior partner of Des Moines, and therefore Iowa's largest law firm, 12 lawyers. And uh, he says, Reinhold, we'd like you to come and join us. And I said, Mr. Brody, I just signed a contract to uh, teach law. He says, well, that isn't going to take you all day. Why don't you, uh, how many courses are you teaching? I says, three. He says, good, you, uh, you can spend the afternoons working with us. <laughs> so at that point, I learned what the 60-hour week was like. And did you maintain that 60-hour week all the way to your oh. adventures in law here in Hawaii? Well, for one year, I did that. and. Uh, but at the age of 23, it, uh, I was kind of tied up because I kept out of the uh, being drafted because I was in the National Guard. Went from uh, rifleman private to warrant officer and uh, decided that uh, I have to get the draft board off my neck. So I, I applied for and was admitted into the United States Air Force as a first lieutenant judge advocate. Okay. So you pursued that in the military? Three years in the military. Okay. My last duty assignment was in uh, uh, City Slomane, Morocco. And from there, my wife and my now three-month-old daughter took a 12,000-mile journey to come to Hawaii. And what brought you here? My wife's from here. Oh, okay. Where did you meet? In school. In, in Iowa? Yes. Wow. And what year did you show up in Hawaii? I showed up in Hawaii in August 1955. 55. And where did you go to work at your first job? I had the same experience I did in Des Moines, knocking doors and looking around. And uh, I got pretty friendly with one of the clerks at the Supreme Court, and she uh, sees me one day and she says, Arthur, I hear uh, Harold Hughes is looking for uh, somebody to help. So I worked, uh, I met Mr. Hughes, and I worked for him for about 13 months. And after that? I joined my present firm. Really? So you joined that, that firm that you're, you've been with ever since in about 56 or 57? Wow. September 57. It was interesting how we did that. Um, 
I was the Supreme Court, and I saw Jay Garner Anthony, who I had faced in court uh, a couple times, and I tried not to disgrace myself too much. And uh, one day he says, Reinwald, um, I like your briefs. Uh, would you consider changing law firms? And I said, in a minute. I was uh, not too happy where I was, and uh, I joined that firm, uh, and just, uh, it, it was just, uh, what do you say? The best experience that I could have personally had in uh, uh, carrying Mr. Anthony's briefcase. So you, you really learned under him? It was an amazing experience. Uh, I would write my briefs. You know, in those days we had mechanical typewriters, so I did everything typed out on the, hint, uh, on the, uh, the royal typewriter, mm -hmm. handed it to a secretary who would retype it into something legible, Hand it to Mr. Anthony, and then I would sit down with her, and next thing out comes the blue pencil. And whoom, whoom. Lines come out, lines come out. It was an amazing thing watching him cut out about anywhere from one third to two thirds of what I had carefully written. Then when I read it again, it was a much better material than I started with. Wow. So it's a great learning experience. Yeah, no, that's here. wonderful. I want to get back to you and, your, and the evolution of the firm yes. that you joined in 1957. But before I do, I want to ask. Our uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Riston here at 502 about his uh, experience and get us caught up to to where you know Art was in his story of his life. Well, I had a similar experience in a way. Uh, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer because I greatly admired my uncle Dudley Pratt, who was the uh, head of the firm that's now Case Lombardi. Uh, and um, I wanted to do the same thing he had done, go to Yale undergrad and Yale Law, and I was fortunate in being able to do that. Came back uh, to Hawaii, where I was born and grew up uh, in 1954 after graduating from law school <clears throat> uh, with a wife from Connecticut and a daughter who was born in our my first year of law school and uh, <clears throat> settled down I uh, there was a family party uh, that uh, to welcome us back and uh, about a day or so after we'd gotten back and I was uh, told by more than one of the people at that party the relatives that a lawyer named Bill Stevenson wanted to see me and uh, so I went in and uh, met Bill and uh, was told not to call him Mr. Stevenson, to call him Bill uh, and uh, we interviewed and the interview lasted uh, quite a long time Then he hired me, took me to lunch. I worked as his, uh, well it was a clerk then associate, uh, uh, summer associate now, I guess, uh, until uh, my first bar, which fortunately I succeeded at, Very good. Uh, the, because um, I, I think that that still holds the record for the longest period of time from when the bar was taken to when the results were announced. And how long was it? Well, I think we started in, if I recall, it was, I think, September, October, uh, August or September with the, with the bar. And the results were announced uh, sometime in January. Uh, I think I was sworn in something like January 21st of 55. But and what did you do during that weird. interim time? Were you a I worked law clerk? Uh, yeah, I worked the whole time. Uh, and, you know, learning. Because one of Bill's motivations was that he wanted to take his family on a long trip in the summer of 1955. So he needed to get me up to speed so that I could fly the office. Uh, and um, he left a couple of people to answer questions if I had any and how to how to do things and 
that was the late Kelly Henshaw and uh, and Tink Ashford, who later became my partner. Ashford came, and actually, he was at the Attorney General's office, and he came uh, to uh, the firm in September, I believe, of 1955. And the firm of Stevenson Ashford was formed. I was the first associate, the only associate, for a number <laughs> of years. And then in January of 1960, it became Stevenson Ashford and Riston. Bill died unexpectedly. And at a very young age, uh, in September of 1964, uh, and uh, because of a Supreme Court rule which has been alluded to previously, uh, we were required to drop his name, which always seemed to me to be just wrong because he had started the whole shebang. and. Uh, if anybody's name should be reflected, it's, it seems like it should be his. But once we settled in, and it, as Ashford and Riston, the uh, firm was never tempted to, as far as I know, to change it. To go back, to yeah. take the Stevens name. So. Well, tell us, uh, for those of us that never knew Mr. Stevens, what, what was his personality like? What, what motivated him? Describe him for us, if you could. Is there such a thing as a lawaholic? He, uh, he lived and breathed law. You worked for him, uh, you could count on very long hours uh, and very stimulating. Uh, he was, um, he would get, if he felt that uh, business was a little bit light, he would uh, go out and walk the Fort Street Mall because invariably somebody would see him stop him and <laughs> tell him about a problem they had he, he just picked up uh, business that way he was a quintessential lawyer he um, he really truly knew the the law and while he had a lovely wife and a very fine young son he probably saw more of us in the law, uh, in, in the law office than uh, he his did of his, of his own family right. because he was so dedicated to practice. So what, if you, Art, if you, I'm sorry, go ahead. When I was working with Harold Hughes and I'd run into some tough uh, questions, Harold said, go talk to Bill Stevenson. And I went over there to talk to Bill Stevenson about it and he gave me some very good suggestions and that's when I met young Jim Riston. Oh, that's when you guys met. Yeah, young Jim Riston. It was about he was born in February. I was born in May of the same year. <laughs> <laughs> well, he looks so young. So, yeah, you've, and you've known each other ever since. But, but, uh, but he would do that. He would, he would answer oh, questions for you even though oh, he sure. wasn't competitors. Any so, lawyer who had, yeah. really had something tough uh, wanted to say, uh, somebody to talk to, Bill Stevenson always held himself ready. He was just, just a super person. Actually, I think that lawyers generally... Uh, did you know it was a it was a far more intimate bar uh, because our numbers were uh, were fewer. Four hundred of us, maybe. We had all kinds of things that, that uh, we did together. Uh, I'm sure that somebody along the line has talked about the picnic every year, and some of those were really quite fun, <laughs> fascinating, <laughs> um, and. There, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, partying that was sponsored by the by the bar, and then Bill, being Bill, uh, I think every single weekend, without exception, uh, he, we were at his home, uh, or he was at either the Ashford home or the Riston home. Wow, and that's and that was your kind of a social. Yeah, uh, part it, of the practice. Yeah, it was. A, it was. We're going to take a break right here and pick up with uh, with the picnic. I want you to describe it. You too, Art. I wanted you to describe the picnic. The picnic was nothing but a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, 
president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Thank you, and welcome back to our episode on maintaining a sense of humor and perspective uh, while practicing in downtown Honolulu. And with me, Jim Riston and Art Reinwald. We were talking about the annual, was it annual bar? It was the annual picnic? bar picnic. And right. where was it held? Well, there were various places, but I think probably the one that stands out the most was um, Ed Silva, who at one time was the Attorney General of Hawaii uh, had a beach place at Mokalia, mm -hmm. and uh, he was frequently the the host. And he'd have uh, people who were probably employed by Wailua Sugar Plantation uh, there to be um, barbecuing uh, wow. open, and they had all kinds of things going on. Uh, there was always a, a game of uh, softball, uh, and uh, somebody who was uh, uh, really, really very devoted to the game was uh, the late governor and associate justice Ingram M. Stainback, uh, and uh, it kind of got the idea that it would be a good thing not to uh, serve him a curveball or anything, so something that would, would he'd be sure to be able to, to hit. hit out of the park, or at least enough to get himself to first base. Uh, was always well received. He did not like to lose. Uh, we're all competitive, but uh, he was probably more so than most of us. Did you attend some of those picnics? I, I attended a couple. Yeah. Did you ever organize them as bar president? No, I did not. Tell me about your 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 year and your tenure as president of the Bar Association of Hawaii. That was a delightful year. It, um, as bar president, I probably put in maybe 20 to 30 hours a week on bar activities and uh, double that. The 60-hour week uh, became the norm again. But it, uh, it was challenging. Uh, the main thing on the bar president is the going to the annual meetings of the American Bar Association, and then there is the meeting of bar presidents. So there's two meetings on the mainland, and we would get more ideas. And coming back for those ideas, I probably started over 20 projects. Can you tell us about them, Art? Uh, Some of them? The, uh, probably the most significant one that we're still uh, blessed or cursed with today is IOLTA, mm. and uh, how it got uh, change from what I conceived to uh, the way it is today uh, is a remarkable thing. Please tell, please tell us how it changed. Well, the idea was that why not have um, all of the interest and clients' accounts and everything else uh, uh, transferred into the bar, and the bar would use this for actually bar activities. For example, my idea was that it would be wonderful if all of the lawyers in Hawaii could have a Hawaii form book for all of their deeds, leases, and contracts, and everything else based on what is Hawaii. And sort of, this is taking the money and making a capital expenditure that would produce dividends and uh, uh, along the line. But somehow, between the time that I conceived of it and the time it got, finally got through, it got to what it is, is that the money will now be used to support uh, indigenous indigent uh, clients. clients. And when, when was this created? I mean, what year was that? Well, let's see, when was I bar president? Hard to say, but let's put it in the 1970s. Okay. And um, 
It probably became into fruition three years after I did it. But I, I said I started about 23 projects. I didn't finish any of them, but Dwight Rush, who follows me, <laughs> finished 16 of them. Oh, and uh, Dwight is no longer alive, but he did a wonderful job uh, succeeding when I uh, had opened up. D did you ever consider running again? I wanted to. You did? But uh, I'm disqualified. I had so much fun as bar president that uh, going to the annual meetings, at uh, one time there was a, a big... Uh, what do you call antitrust division investigation of all the bar associations to see if they are engaged in unlawful practice of law. And uh, in the middle of the meeting, while everybody is going back and forth, I finally stood up and made a, in a, a speech pointing out the illegality of their attempting to serve us with these uh, questionnaires and everything else, and pointed out that if uh, they uh, send that questionnaire to Hawaii, I will respectfully decline to answer. It was pointed out to me uh, later on by the president of the ABA, who was a actually top uh, antitrust expert. He says, Ryan, all that would have put you in jail. <laughs> <laughs> wow. J uh, Jim, did you ever serve in the uh, for the Hawaii Bar Association in any officer capacity? I did. And uh, what was it? I was the treasurer one year. Uh, we supplied three bar presidents uh, in our firm, Bill Stevenson, Tink Ashford, and Mike Gibson. Yes. Uh, as I recall, and um, I enjoyed my uh, my year as, uh, as as treasurer, and I enjoyed being on the uh, on the board. And at one time, I was uh, head of what was then a, a committee, legal ethics committee. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I never served as president okay. of the bar. Well, thank you for that service, both of you. Thank you for that service. Uh, tell tell us what it was like, the young lawyers that are going to be watching this program, tell, tell us what it was like just in general, the, the legal atmosphere of Honolulu in the 1950s and 1960s, if you can, you know, recall, relate that to us. Practice was, uh, it was generally a pleasure. Everybody, lawyers are always competitive. They were representing the client. And they wanted to give 100% of themselves for their client, or some one or two fellows I once described it, they always gave 120% of themselves. But uh, when it came to dealing lawyers face to face, uh, if we talk and one fellow said, I will do it, uh, I didn't need anything in writing. I could uh, rely on the fact that it will be done. And that when it wasn't, it was a rare exception. You didn't have to send a confirming email. Uh, no, no confirming email, no confirming letters, no trying to place the thing down. Right. It was it was that way, and uh, but I remember one uh, fellow who was the most charming fellow. He says, "You couldn't he you couldn't trust him. He would never keep up with his word, but he was such a smiling, charming fellow. Everybody always forgave him." They always did. There were only about two or three rascals, though, at the whole bar. That's right. And you knew who they and were. And you knew who they oh, were. Right. And you didn't. Uh, you you did kind of go the extra step of getting a written confirmation when you were dealing with. But Art's right. We uh, we never had to do that generally. The annual meeting was held in the uh, Supreme Court uh, chambers, <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, Four hundred lawyers in the bar, maybe three hundred would show up for that meeting. Oh, it's great it, attendance. It does. Uh, as Jim pointed out earlier, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Right. Just. The joy of being lawyers. Uh, Jim, what did you get paid when you started with Ashford? I would start with Stevenson. $335 a month. A month, not an hour. No, a month. An hour, oh, okay. A month. See, he was paid 10% more than the Herald Hughes paid me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I tell you? That's wonderful. And <laughs> That's we were expected to work uh, 50 to 60 hours a week. Sure. Billable time. Mm -hmm. Mostly. Okay. But Did you keep timesheets the way oh, oh, associates do religiously. today? Religiously. Religiously. That's right. Yeah. Right up to this day? Yeah. Still, you know, yeah. if you're... Uh, I, I do so. Yeah. You yeah. have to. You have to. I, I put down my hours whenever I work, which isn't very much these days. These but days. Still five to six hours a week. Well, okay. So tell me how then... Uh, I want to ask this question to both of you. That tell me about the evolution of you know, the Jay Garner Anthony firm, the Stevens firm, to the firms that they became with you, both you fellows with your, your names in the marquee. I mean, how, what, what occurred? How did, how did you grow? How did, what direction did you go? What did you do? Do you want to lead off? Okay. <laughs> the, 
uh, we had a we had a few uh, larger uh, clients had more work, uh, and virtually all of them started out as uh, Bill Stevenson clients. And uh, first thing I ever did was uh, to work for a Bill Stevenson client. And uh, gradually, we picked them up ourselves, and he kept picking up uh, the, the clients, and he couldn't handle them all. Right. So he would hand off uh, to either Tink or me, uh, depending on the type of thing that uh, it was in his estimation of who could best serve that client. And uh, the firm grew as the, as the clients grew. I think in a previous program, uh, one of the lawyers being interviewed alluded to statehood and there was a huge push uh, toward growth in everything when Hawaii became a state. When we became a state, all of a sudden, for example, uh, all of the major insurance companies mm -hmm. found it uh, respectable, desirable to, uh, to come to Hawaii and to make loans in Hawaii. Prior to that, uh, although the legal services were as sound as they were after statehood, uh, it was only a, a few that ever bothered. With the advent of uh, capital, we were able to, to build, and uh, as you know, there was a, an explosion of building. Right. Yes, probably on the order of greater than what we're seeing today in Kakaako, right? Tower cranes everywhere. Not quite as congested, but yeah. yes. Yes. That's the, uh, the climbing crane became the state bird. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, okay. How about you, Art? Tell, tell us about the evolution of, of your firm, and the one that exists today. The uh, firm, when I joined it, had six lawyers. They had just lost uh, one fellow by the name of William Quinn, who had been appointed uh, by the president to be the governor of the state of Hawaii. So I was called in to fill his slot, which was not easy. He was a, he was a tremendous lawyer. And I worked with uh, some very good lawyers, very, uh, one of a specialist in realty, and, um, but mostly the firm was built around litigation. Okay. And you were in the courtroom? All the time. Yes. Mostly carrying the Garner Anthony's bag. But, yeah. Uh, well, what was it like? What was it like? Tell us about the judges. What was the courtroom demeanor like? What was it like trying a case in front of a jury at that time? Probably no different than today, it, uh, except uh, we didn't have all the scientific ways of uh, looking over jurors and putting them through a computer and everything else, so we just had to take it on how they looked. And mm -hmm. Kind of gut feel. It gut feel, and, but... Uh, Intuition. With all of this thing, the results uh, could be the same, it could not be, uh, may, may be different because the real trial lawyers, it's, uh, uh, one of my partners once told me, he says, Reinhold, when you go into court to try a case, bring a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, when it came down to it in my specialties, I probably tried to completion more cases than most of the trial lawyers, because I was the tax lawyer, uh, the tax lawyer and the trust lawyer. And okay. so I probably have tr uh, actually tried over 50, 60 in trial before a judge uh, tax cases both uh, federal and state. state. And in trust litigation, I probably the same number, 50 to 60 times. It's a, it's a lot, a lot of time in court. That's right. And, but uh, how did you find the judges? What were they like as a group? Across the board, uh, indecipherable, but on a one-by-one -one basis. <laughs> yeah. So I would, uh, when Dick Yin Wong became the judge of the tax appeal court, all of a sudden I started winning all over the place because I presented cases intelligently, well thought of, put together, and he was so smart in tax law you couldn't put anything over on him. Uh, when I would run into other judges, all of a sudden we had knew nothing about tax law, things became uh, more problematical. So arguments began to prevail over what the law was like. At, uh, right. I think one of the funny things about um, law 
when we started out, uh, lawyers were more formal. We wore suits, ties regularly, yes. and uh, there wasn't even an Aloha Friday uh, for, for many years. And the, uh, and the judges were very informal, but that all switched. The judges donned robes, and yes. the, and and the, while we still wore uh, coats and ties for courtroom appearances, otherwise we dropped them completely, and the uh, air conditioning in the courthouse became more dependable than it was. It, uh, I don't know if they still have it on. I've never had occasion to look, but they used to have the dog day rule where you did not have to go to trial in August wow. because of the, the weather and the state of uh, air conditioning. Yeah, uh, air conditioning was, uh, well, some people had it and a lot of people Open the window. didn't. You know, you <laughs> opened the windows and relied upon cross ventilation and the trades. Thank you. We're going to take a, a break and, and we'll resume. Thank you. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii. And it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Albers from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us. Hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on. Uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Moriwaki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. 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 Thank you, and welcome back to uh, Living Legal Legends, the three-digit project. With me today, Jim Riston, uh, three-digit uh, 502, and Art Reinwald, uh, three-digit 390. Uh, even though they're only a month apart, they're almost 100-plus uh, digits apart in terms of your bar numbers. It's because it was alphabetically assigned. Correct. I see. So we have, a, we have an R and we have a W. Right. See, I can't become the lowest number until the Andersons and the cases of uh, finally uh, <laughs> fully retire or pass away. Okay. I want to ask you in the, in the 15 minutes that we have remaining that about your perspective and your sense of humor, which, which you've maintained throughout the years, both of you, uh, even though uh, I'm sure that during your times in the courtroom and dealing with opponents in particular, maybe some difficult clients, that it's not always been easy to do that. And so I'm wondering, I'm going to start with you, Jim. How, how is it that you, you've got a smile on your face today after the battles that you've waged in downtown Honolulu? I don't know. I, I think it's just part of uh, makeup, how people, uh, how, how people are. They either uh, are very pessimistic and see the dark side of everything or uh, or they tend to be optimistic I think I've always been an optimist and able to see the humor in different things uh, I don't know if, uh, if he was ever mentioned but uh, we had a trial lawyer here for many years and a fellow named O.P. Suarez O.P. Oliver P. Suarez he was, uh, he, he was really quite good uh, as, a, as, as a trial lawyer, and he'd come to the law by a clerkship. It was still possible when he became a member of the bar that you didn't have to go to uh, law school. I think it was still possible that you could 
uh, be orally examined by the judges of the justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, in any event, when you had something with OP, you could almost always count upon something funny happening. And one of the things that I remember in particular uh, was uh, a probate matter that uh, where I was trying to establish the last will and testament of uh, a very elderly uh, Portuguese woman uh, who primarily spoke Portuguese, some, uh, some broken English. And uh, I had a doctor on the stand and he had, and um, OP had counsel with him Council wasn't quite as wily and experienced as, as OP. Uh, and um, OP, uh, at, on cross-examination of my doctor witness, who was testifying that the woman did understand what she was signing, uh, was not under any compulsion, etc. Uh, he thought he had uh, he, he thought he had the witness nailed because uh, he said, well, doctor, how do you communicate with an elderly Portuguese woman? And he said, oh, it's just a combination of a, a little smattering of, of, of Spanish and some, uh, some pidgin English. And at that point, OP broke in and he said, uh, your honor, we are willing to stipulate that Portuguese is Spanish poorly spoken? <laughs> <laughs> Who was the judge? You remember? No, not oh. offhand. Okay. It was probably uh, in those days. It was probably Bill Fairbanks, who was the father of David, Dave. David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Op was uh, notorious. He never appeared in public without a totally white suit, right? And a big floppy hat, covering a face that can be kindly described as hatchet faced. It was a nose and everything. It was just... Kind And when he had attacked you, boy, you were attacked. But then you look again, his eyes are just twinkling away. Oh, okay. So he, he, was, a, he was a kindly man. Kindly man. Yeah, so how about, how about you, Art? What, how, how, did, how have you maintained your sense of humor and your, your wit and, and perspective? Uh, the practice of law, when you finally get down to it, has a lot of stress. And it's mostly stress uh, for the way I do it. It's in my mind. I've, the answer is there. Where is it? And you keep looking and you keep looking. And if you don't have a sense of humor about it, um, if you can find an open window, you jump out of it. Because the stress on you is just that heavy. But no matter what it is, it can be funny, it can be joyous. And I can just remember spending five and a half, six hours one day after dinner, going back down to the office, and two in the morning, it came. I found the exact case that I wanted, and there I am running around the halls with a thing in my ear, screaming, I got you, you SOB. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself, because you are the funniest thing in the world uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, approach to life. It's, uh, it, if you can look at yourself and say, right, all that was weird, uh, uh, okay. it retains your sanity. Okay. You, you both are, are so professional. Is, is that part of it, too? You, you try to approach people, clients, lawyers, judges, with, a, with respect and, and professionalism that you've both come to, to enjoy and to practice? It is, uh, without that, again, you just cannot be a lawyer. You can go through the motions and have a light and call yourself a lawyer, but that uh, you have to be really professional. And I can remember being in court. This is uh, one of the compliments I remember, treasure the most. There's one lady lawyer who I won't name, but uh, who is just absolutely nasty in the courtroom and everything else. And I finished one session with her, and I got back to the office, and I get a call from her, and she says, Arthur, I have to say this, I, you have a high degree of civility. <laughs> 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 oh, it's, it's a wonderful comment. Comments you treasure. 
Yes, 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 indeed. Probably started off, though, again, as a consequence of the bar being as small as it was, don't you think? Because, I think, you, you know, know you we know couldn't be too nasty to one another because uh, we, we went out and did things together and we saw each other all the time. And even when you appeared in court against somebody uh, at, the, at the break, you'd be walking out with that person, talking to them. And it was a very, very civil bar. And you walk up Bishop Street, uh, for example. Uh, uh, some fellow from California was with me, and uh, I introduced him to uh, some fellow. He said, well, who is that? I said, oh, that was uh, the mayor, Mayor Fonsi. We walk about another 10 yards, and then another one says, well, hi, Art, how are you? And he says, who's that? And I introduce him, this is our chief justice. And finally, we get to the end of the block, and out comes the governor. <laughs> and this is the kind of community it was. It, uh, you can go into, uh, for example, uh, Charlie's uh, Arcade Fountain on the, uh, uh, not Hotel, on the, just downtown, I don't remember the street. But, uh, and you look in there, and there's Governor Burns and his entourage just having you just, everybody, the pretension wasn't there. The wall wasn't there. He went to Mass, and then he went to coffee at the Hobnob. That's right. In the old uh, Alexander Young building. Every day. <laughs> did, did he go to Mass up at the... Uh, yes. The Our Lady of Peace, yes. Right. Wow. Daily? daily. Yes, daily. Wow. Uh, so you always knew where to find him if you needed him. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be a good time to approach him. <laughs> no, no. no but at the Hobnob, no, he'd always have a... Uh, he'd always have a bunch of his buddies um, with him, you know. So it, you might, I guess you might go by and say that uh, I'd like to have a minute with you sometime, Governor. Could you give me a call or tell me when it might be convenient? Uh, but nothing more than that. I'll, I'll throw out one more name. The name is Meyer Simons. Yes. Simons and Boslaw. Bob Simons. Bob Simons, whatever it was called. And uh, Meyer was um, purportedly to be a communist and was investigated by the government, by the uh, anti-communist groups and the Congress and everything else. And, and you just wonder what he's like. And But I learned very early, it's true to think his quality was Meyer. He's always ready to tell you a dirty joke. <laughs> and secondly, when he said anything, it was gospel. As far as I will do this, uh, you can count. You can count on everything he promised. He's a good lawyer. And what was his area of practice? Labor Meyer law. Side. Labor law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Eddie Nakamura was one of his uh, close people. Uh, Justice Nakamura. Yes. Yes. Did did now did either of you have much uh, law work on na neighbor islands back in say the fifties or sixties or? Were the islands more separated business-wise? I did a lot. How'd you of, describe I did, that? I did a lot of probates on the other islands. Okay. I once had the record for the shortest time on the island of Kauai. How short was it? I feel like Ed McMahon today. Oh, How well, short was, was it, it, Mr. Reinwald? Let's see. The plane arrived, and they immediately caught the taxi to the courthouse. They got in there, and uh, the judge was on the bench, and he says, "Oh, Mr. Reinwald, excuse me, Mr. Reinwald's just here for a little brief thing," and so I went up and made my presentation. He says, "Approved." Uh, Where's the order? I says, here, bring it up, I'll sign it. He signed it, I turned the order into the clerk, got it back, caught the same taxi back to the airport, caught the same plane back, total time on the island of Kauai, 23 minutes. <laughs> Was that reflected on your timesheet? Every bit of it. All right, okay, <laughs> very good. How about you? How about you, and you Jim? Any, uh, any neighbor island practice? Uh, time Some there? I used to go up uh, primarily because I do a lot of uh, real estate law, real property. Yeah. Uh, I used to go up to an island that a developer client was interested in doing something on. and uh, I remember in particular uh, going up to the island of Hawaii that way and uh, being put up in the old Hilo Hotel. Uh, and uh, I had a portable royal typewriter with me and my client was uh, an interesting guy from California who was getting options when he could and uh, I would type up what it was that he wanted to get you know draft it and type it uh, and uh, he'd be off and running with the thing and uh, trying to get it so 
you know, I'd stay there a, a, a couple of days. Uh, uh, Hilo in those days uh, kind of folded up by 8 o'clock at night. Uh, the only thing that uh, entertainment that I can recall was uh, going down and uh, watching sumo wrestling uh, in, uh, in the park there. But well, The real sumo, it was live sumo wrestling. Yes, live yeah. sumo wrestling. Wow. Yeah. And, and that, uh, not by the uh, Queen Lily Okilani Gardens there? Not that far over. Okay. It was, uh, you know, when you went down uh, the main Banyan street, Drive. Oh, yeah, okay. you, you found the, there was a big park area and there was a kind of a gazebo type of thing and that was where they, uh, where they had their matches, I guess you call them. Real quick, just as we finish here, Art, what, what word of advice would you give to our five-digit lawyers? Word of advice, be yourself. Be yourself. Thank you. How about you, Jim? Hang in there. Hang in there. And you both have done a fine job of doing just that. We really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your experiences as three-digit lawyers. Thank you. It's been fun. We appreciate your heaviness. Oh, our pleasure's <laughs> all ours, believe me. Thank you.